delighted uh, in more ways than one to introduce to you our uh, keynote speaker, Dr. Elsa Nystrom. Um, I recommended her as our speaker. Um, I have been looking forward to hearing her on Joan after reading her on Joan Newton Cuneo, and I'm glad she found her because I tried to look for her a couple of times and she was missing, but um, she was missing for me because I couldn't do the, res the research, the magnificent research that uh, Elsa did. Um, I asked Elsa uh, to provide a, a biography and she describes herself as the quintessential non-traditional student. She said she didn't take classes until she and her husband Chuck had four children. She graduated from Wilbur Wright Junior College, which is now four-year college in Chicago, but didn't go back to school until she had seven children. She got a scholarship to Judson College and enjoyed being a Catholic among the Baptists. <laughs> uh, her mentor encouraged her to go to graduate school and she was accepted at Loyola University of Chicago. Um, back with the Catholics again, she says, LOL. Then she moved to Georgia, she and her family moved to Georgia uh, in 1987 to escape Chicago weather. My niece wants to do that. She, was, she writes for the Big Ten in Chicago and she wants back. I completed uh, my degree, she says, and was hired at Kennesaw College, State College, then a smallish place under 8,000. When she retired from the college three years ago, it had grown to 35,000? Wow. Uh, her main interest has always been social and cultural history in Georgia. She gravitated towards stock car racing and became a Bill Elliott fan, yay, and started writing about racing. In fact, she was writing a book uh, called The Need for Speed, and she was doing some research, and she came, up, came upon a paragraph on Joan Newton, and you'll have to tell them what you found in there that took you away from The Need for Speed to uh, Joan Newton. She says the rest is history, but the rest is a book, Mad for Speed, The Racing Life of Joan uh, Newton Cuneo. It was published in 2013 by McFarland Press. Um, she has a lot of other uh, interests. Um, she and her husband have traveled extensively in the United States um, and overseas. She writes a blog, a travel blog, Georgia Rambler, that's the name of your blog. Hmm. Um, she might go back, though, to the book, The Need for Speed. Um, but currently, she's doing some research uh, on Hart Field, which was originally a, a, an auto racing track, 1909 to 1911, and then was uh, converted into an airstrip. So she has multiple, multiple interests. Uh, she says that her son, her youngest son, uh, of her seven children, is uh, also, like his mom, a social and cultural historian. And is it true you're the only mother-son pair yes. <laughs> of such historians in the United States? So um, I think that's a good intro to her multiple talents and expertise. So I give you Elsa. <laughs> ah, ooh, the light. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I always say, usually I end up talking to audiences that are mostly male, and I have to say one of these things is not like the other, and that would be me, since I'm the first female presenter uh, this time around. But Pat is right. I found Joan Cuneo by accident when I was doing something entirely different, and, okay, come on. All right, where do I click it? <laughs> Point it over here. Over here? Oh, at the computer, duh. Switch turned on? Ah. No, Josh. 
<laughs> okay, I saw, I read a paragraph about the woman you got women banned from racing. And uh, that was actually uh, Joan, who is right there. And she's very impatient. She looks like if she had a tail, she'd be switching it. She wants them to get that car out of there. And so I thought, well, who is this woman? And that started me on, it took about four or five years of uh, very slow work, but I would say that for most racing historians or people that work in ephemerals, the digitization of newspapers has really helped a lot. And in fact, every year there's more to look at. I met along the way members of the Newton family and the Cuneo family and was able to get some family background from them, which was not in the newspaper. Now the Newtons are a proud New England family. They came over you know, the boat after the Mayflower. And they, they're very proud of their family history. And uh, even Joan's mother uh, came from a prominent Dutch family from New York. Now, uh, there are the Newton families in 1860 at Thanksgiving. And there are actually six brothers. Joan's father is this fellow here, John Carter. Int interesting to me, none of them served in the Civil War. And look at these guys, they're all military age. They live in Holyoke, Massachusetts, and none of them served in the military. They made millions, four of them became millionaires shortly afterwards. So, uh, here are her mom and dad, and they had four girls. Joan was the youngest of four. There were eight years between the oldest and the youngest. And her dad really treated her like a son more than a daughter. I think he really wanted a son. He didn't get one. He got Joan. And she was better than nothing. There is a family story about her. She was supposed to have walked across the ridge line of a church under construction, which was about 60 feet above the ground when she was 10 or 11. And they all say it's true, and I kind of believe it because it's such an unusual story. It's not the kind of thing anyone would make up. So she was a tomboy, and he let her do things that boys would, rather than girls would do, uh, even though she always wore a hat. <laughs> well, not always, but a, a hat's were her trademark. Here she's looking kind of grubby up in uh, Vermont, and yet she's got a hat on. So, um, that will be a trademark. Whenever you see a picture of her, she almost always has a hat on. This is a steam train that her father and his brothers built to haul lumber in Vermont. He let her drive it. Now, she was a really good athlete, and she could do anything that was open to girls. Now, remember, this is still Victorian America. Her family was definitely upper class, and there were limitations and restrictions, but I think her father must have encouraged her because she actually got to drive a six-horse team when they were out in California, and that takes a lot of strength. Even though she was a thin, scrawny-looking little girl, uh, they had to make her into a lady or at least give her the outward trappings so she went to three different boarding schools to be finished. Her sisters only went to one. She went to three. And that tells me that it was not so easy to finish Joan. So, but finished she was. And here she is with her hair up. Look at, and this is, I mean, look how thin her little arms are. It, is that someone that could drive a six horse team? Evidently, because she did it. So she looks a little wistful there. She, her marriage is one of the things that would change her life. Um, she was 22, and she married Andrew Cuneo, who was uh, the nephew of a mafia-connected fellow called the Banana King, Antonio Cuneo who was a millionaire, and he also had one of those banks that lent money to the immigrants, and he owned a bunch of slum property. Well, Andrew, his nephew, was his heir, 
And uh, as a result, he also inherited millions. And I, we have no idea how they met because he was in New York, Joan was in Massachusetts, although her father surely went to New York on business. But they were engaged and they got married. And uh, there are no pictures of their wedding, which tells me that the family, the rest of the family didn't approve. And financially it was good, socially it was terrible mismatch. And she also had a sweetheart in Holyoke, but she married Andrew. And they went off to uh, Paris. She might have seen some of the early cars then, right around the turn of the century, and then spent six months in Sicily. And we, we don't really know. I kind of think her father was in poor health. He would die the year after she got married. And he had remarried um, a widow. And she would inherit four-ninths of his estate. And he wanted to provide for Joan. So the other daughters were all married. So he arranged this marriage. And Joan followed his wishes. This is the Cuneo Bank. I found this picture by accident. It is uh, in the Library of Congress. And I was just looking through pictures, and I looked at that, and I said, hot doggies, that's the Cuneo Bank. And this is where it's located, in Little Italy, um, which is now Chinatown. So if you, sometimes you get lucky when you're doing research. Now, she and Andrew had two children by 1900, so they had two children almost right away. Unfortunately, her youngest daughter, and I'm pretty sure she had mumps or measles or something, she lost her hearing at the age of two. She came, became completely deaf and would have to go to a school for the deaf, and they then it seemed to do something to the marriage as well. They had no more children, <clears throat> and Andrew spent an increasing amount of time away from home Joan was bored even though she lived with his aunt, the wife of the deceased Banana King, and seemed to like her a lot. So it tells me something about Joan, that she was willing to blend in with her husband's family even though her own family disapproved of them. So, but anyway, she didn't have much to do there because it wasn't her house. They had a nurse and nanny, all those things. And so her husband bought her a car. He want, wanted to keep her busy. And ironically, I think he actually did get her a small used electric car first because of the location. They were in a rural area, and that's what women used to drive around in, in those early years. But she didn't like it because it was too slow. So he bought her another car um, after that when they moved to Richmond Hill in a big old Victorian, big new Victorian. This is their house right here. It is uh, it's actually looking towards us. You can see the station where Andrew commuted to, to his bank. So when they moved there, he bought her a locomobile. And you, Car people know this is a very good car. It wasn't highly reviewed back then. And it was more or less a learning tool for Joan. And the first time she drove it, she forgot to turn off the boiler. She actually called on somebody on Park Avenue, if you believe. And the water all boiled out of it. And so she had to get it towed home. And, uh, but she said, oh, it's too slow. So uh, her husband thought that he would get her another car, and he would also get someone to help her learn about cars. And so he engaged Lou Disbro as kind of a mechanic tutor, and uh, later on he'll be her riding mechanic, even though he had a somewhat sketchy reputation. How sketchy? Well, he had been accused of murder it, which is pretty sketchy, and, uh, but he got off, and I've read all the trial accounts, and I, I don't really think he was guilty, but um, 
because the evidence was circumstantial, but he knew about cars. They were neighbors, his family stood by him. But you see, here he is, right there, Lou, and this is the gal he is supposed to have murdered. Anyway, Lou becomes Joan's close friend. And they would be together over until at least 1910, 1911, even after she could no longer race. Um, then he would drive her cars when they wouldn't let her drive them. So they, it, that was good, but it also distracted uh, her from knowing what her husband was doing. So here's Joan, and if you look, she's got her, her hand right there. There's a big diamond ring on that finger. Uh, it's, it's hard to see. I had to use a mic microscope, to see, or mic magnifying glass rather, to see it. But this is the car he bought her, a white steam car, cost about $5,000, sturdy, strong, and she started driving it between uh, Long Island and Vermont on a regular basis. Um, she heard about the Glidden tour. In 1905, Jasper Glidden, who had already, with his wife, driven around the world in a, in a Napier, actually, um, decided to organize a reliability tour, another one, because there were lots but his becomes the most famous. And people would sign up to drive over 870 miles, mostly unpaved. At that time, maybe five, 600 miles of paved roads in the whole country, mostly in the cities. And uh, it would extend from, from July 11th to July 22nd. Um, women were allowed to travel as passengers, but not to enter as drivers. It, it was a it was kind of a guy thing for the driving, the women and, and children even went along uh, for the ride, so to speak. But Joan read the rules carefully, and she sent in her entry. And even though they didn't like it, they let her in. Now, this is an example of the roads the motorists would be encountering on the Glidden Tour. This is a picture of a Pathfinder car from 1905. Uh, they sent a pathfinder ahead to make sure um, that they could get through and if there was no bridge to hire some, somebody to take them over the bridge. And uh, so anyway, the, the AAA, by 1905, the AAA had become the sanctioning body of all things racing in the, and automotive, really, in the United States. The three A's had accepted the Glidden's rules, sanctioned them. They didn't, it, they didn't exclude women, but then they didn't think any woman would have the nerve to enter, to drive, but Joan did. And when they said, well, it's not for women, she said, well, you didn't say women could do it, and I, I want to do it, so they let her but her car was entered in her husband's name, and that would be the case. She would drive two more Glidden tours, and in every one, the car was entered in her husband's name, but he didn't do any of the driving. I'm not even sure he knew how to drive. He was, he was definitely a uh, take-the-train-to-work sort of person. Um, when she becomes famous, it's because of an accident. On the very first day of the tour, um, they were driving down a road where they were doing some construction. How novel. <laughs> and uh, the uh, construction workers had flagged the car in front of her to stop, and he started backing up. Well, there, of course, there were no taillights. And by the time she noticed he was backing up, she tried to swerve out of the way. One of her wheels caught the edge of the bridge and her car flipped over the side. Um, she had a full load of passengers. Her husband went along, uh, Lou Disbro and his sister went along, and they were all dumped into the water. Another picture, there were a lot of pictures of, of this. Uh, 
They ride the car, Joan gets in, she drives it out, they dust themselves off, and they continue. And there they are. This is after the flip into the water. The car is a little banged up. I love this picture. It has nothing to do with my presentation. <laughs> a little girl with her goggles on, probably dreaming of when she too would get to drive a car. Uh, so, on this first Glidden tour, they were going to stop halfway at the brand new inn on Washington Mountain. Um, it is now owned by the Omni. It's still there. And uh, the, the 3A, the triple A's had made special triptychs. And I don't know if any of you have ever gotten a triple A triptych. Well, they had them in 1905. And they were probably more important then than they are now. So the tourists, as they were called, knew where they would stop and where they would find something to eat, and so on and so forth. Uh, they scheduled a hill climb at the midway stop. And of course, Joan was determined to do it, but she would find out, there they are, all the cars lined up uh, at the White Mountain Hotel, brand new. And there she is in her steam car. It's already been stripped for the hill climb. Uh, she was going to do it, she and Lou Disbro were going to do it the first day, uh, but then it got foggy. And they, they had stripped the car, and then by the second day, the officials had thought about it, and there they are. Um, they thought about it, and they, they, they no, no, this woman cannot do this. And she was absolutely furious because they were ready to do it. The car was ready. And uh, <laughs> later she gives an interview to the newspaper, and she said, I've operated a car five years. She was lying a little bit. Um, and I know my car a lot better than men. And if some of the cars went up in the course in the time accredited, I can put my car up faster. I believe I could back it, run it sideways, or any old way, and uh, land there in better time than some of the men drivers. Uh, she was talking trash uh, even in 1905. Uh, but of course, she did do it, but was not timed and they didn't mention it in the account. Uh, but then she thought about it, and she goes back to her ladylike persona, and she said, I can see why the officials bar women from the climb. It is very dangerous, and most women are timid. But certainly, I have shown <laughs> that I am far from timid and know how to handle my car. But I love this. Uh, she, you know, she becomes meek, and then her temper is kind of creeping out. Um, but she, she's going to run, it, run into problems with the AAA during her career. And I just want to say that one negative result of the, uh, the tours was the speed trap. It, it didn't take the local police long to realize that they could ticket these tourists because the speed limits at that time were very low and they were driving through their little towns and they would hide out. They did on this Glidden tour. And uh, of course, the, the tourists could speed faster than the cops, so they were waiting for them on the way back. And Joan and a bunch of her friends had to go to court and pay a fairly large fine. So speed trap has always been with us. Now, Joan really liked to go fast. And Although the Glidden was not a race, they made the mistake of numbering the cars in the same way that race cars are numbered. And that was a mistake as far as I'm concerned uh, because, of course, some of the people wanted to race. And Joan was almost always the first or the second one there um, until her car crapped out, if I may use <laughs> a common word on the last day. Uh, it had been abused, it dumped into the water in it, and so she didn't get back to do the parade in New York City. But the fall into the creek was so publicized that when she got home, some newspapers contacted her and asked if she wanted to go race. And of course she said yes. They got her car out of the garage where it was being repaired 
they stripped it and they headed off to Atlantic City. Um, and that was the beginning of her racing career. So, you, you know, for those of you that don't know, and I'm sure most of you do, uh, the early races were not, the cars that competed in the early races were not purpose built. Uh, people used it, regular cars and took everything off, tried to make them streamlined and lighter weight, and uh, so in doing so, stripped them for action. Um, so you could take all the parts off because they were built by hand and then you could put them back on after a while. Um, but sometimes these parts fell off, the parts that weren't taken off fell off while they were racing, which was disconcerting to say the least. Um, so this is another white, in this, this picture, um, they only bought the chassis. And, you know, we were talking about how sometimes the chassis is, the, the Bentley, for example, the, they just built the chassis and the body was built by somebody else, but you could also buy just the chassis and that's what they did, so they didn't have to bother stripping it. So. She had a garage built in the back of her house. Joan never did things by half. And uh, her husband had plenty of money, and she worked on her cars, but she always wore a dress. I have never seen her in a picture where she's wearing pants, slacks. Uh, and she's pretty greasy, too. So during the next four years, before women were banned, she would attempt every type of automotive speed competition there was. Setting women's speed records, that was the most common racing against others on tracks, both men and women. She didn't race against women very often, most of them chicken out. Um, hill climbs, gymkhanas, where they, they raced over obstacles, um, which was not really a race, but a timed event for the best time, and reliability runs like the Glen. Not really a race, but sort of. She learned how to change a tire. And I want to say, the camera is not always kind to Joan. And looking at pictures that aren't identified, sometimes it's hard to tell. Well, this one I know it is. She's wearing a hat. But look, at, isn't this an awful picture? Uh, someone should have thrown that one out. Uh, but anyway, uh, between 1905, when she started in her first race in 1909, when she defeated a number of men, at the Mardi Gras meet in New Orleans, Joan was constantly in the news. She would compete in two more Glidden tours. In 1906, she was in Europe, so she didn't do that one. And there was no American woman at this time who could beat her, I don't think. She was determined, she was fearless, uh, she just loved it. And uh, a few women said, oh yeah, I'll come and race, and then they never showed up. So not everyone liked her though. Uh, here she is racing somewhere. I, I'm not really sure where that actually is. Not New Orleans. I found this identified as the racing in the 1905 Glidden and I, I don't believe it because look she's wearing a fur coat and a fur hat in July. I don't think so even up at, at the top of Mount Washington because you could see she was in a shirt waist and that first picture, so, um, but it, it is a 1905 photo. This is a rare copy of Joan's memoir that was written for Rainier Motors in 1905. There's only one that still exists. It's at the Benton Ford uh, Library, and they, after much coaxing, made uh, color scans of it for me. It's, it's very interesting. And it, this is the inside, the cute little Art Deco pigs. Of course, they were accused of running over pigs in, in the race. And there she is down at the bottom. It's too bad it's right in the, in the crack of the, the thing. So uh, the trophy that she got by her, from her fellow participants, um, her son, and uh, this is the, the route. You can see where they, they went in 1907. This was a much longer tour than the, the first one, well over 1,000 miles. 
So here she is as queen of the New York Auto Show. Her son and daughter are in the car with her, and it's, it's an unusual Italian, like a Lyra, a Laura, something like that. Um, so she was popular. There she is, 1908, and I kind of think this is the same picture that was my title, only it's a side profile because the hat's the same. Here she is changing a tire. She did work on her cars. It's a great picture. Um, New Orleans. When Joan was invited to participate in this Mardi Gras festival in New Orleans, she was really excited at last the chance to race other women on the track. She had a new car of 50 horsepower Knox. And the Knox, although not specifically built for racing, had already been used successfully by other male racers. And it was faster than her Rainier. And during the race, the fans began calling it, it was the giant, but they began calling it the giant test because Joan had a lot of success with it. Um, so anyway, um, when she went, the only racer who had a better car was Ralph De Palma, and he was driving a 90 horsepower Fiat Cyclone and would win all his races. He had the best car, the fastest car by a bunch. Um, here she is with Lou Disbro yeah, bro, getting the Knox ready. You can see it, it's uh, stripped pretty much, no lights on. And, uh, but Mardi Gras races were a little dissatisfying because no other women showed up. And so that didn't stop her. She entered all the races that she could and the, the organizers were taken aback because they didn't expect it. And she did pretty well. She raced in almost all the events. Uh, the only one that she faltered in was the 50, 50 mile race. I mean, she is, was a small woman and she raced a lot and she was tired, she finished second. But a month later, the AAA announced that women had been banned from any sanctioned events. And that included the Glidden Tours. So she couldn't even do those. Now, what was it like to drive a 1909 Knox? Well, I've, I've read a few uh, accounts by other drivers, and you have to say that, well, you were high up. There was no windshield. The steering wheel was very close, uh, no belts, heavy steering. Uh, tires were only three and a half inches wide. The tracks were rutted, and so you really had to work the wheel to get your car going in a straight line. There were three pedals, the clutch, gas, and the brake, but on the side there were two levers, the emergency brake, which had a little more stopping power, and one for the tranny. And to the, to the immediate right was an open chain drive spewing oil all over you when you raced. So here she is, you can see there's, there's the chain over there. Uh, this is on the Shell Road in New Orleans, and uh, Disbro is her riding mechanic. Her son has come along, although she said her son was really cautious and he didn't like racing. It was her daughter who enjoyed racing, which is interesting. So uh, this is one of the cups she won at New Orleans, the amateur race. Uh, was, it was supposed to be for men, but Say la vie. When the AAA announced that women could, were, were going to be banned, Joan and some of the other women who enjoyed driving, and even in the Glidden tours, were really mad. And some of the men she competed with were really angry about this. And they complained and wrote to the newspapers, but it didn't do any good. And so even though she threatened to sue, it wasn't going to, she knew it wouldn't come to a good end. So. She gave up. She tried. She continued to set speed records. She actually got to 112 miles per hour 
in, in, for a half mile in a borrowed race car that was not adjusted to fit her small body. And uh, one of the last things she did officially was to drive the press car in the New York to Atlanta Good Roads tour. Uh, basically, I think she did it because she wanted to drive around the new Atlanta racetrack, which was, had just been completed, which she did. Um, this is one of the photos where she's trying to, to get in the Fort George hill, hill climb, she, but they don't let her. And you can just see, you get an idea of how small she is in this picture. She's a small woman. And uh, here she is, ready to run up Giants to Spare car strip, she's happy, but she can't do it officially, but she does do it. And I was lucky to find this picture where she is actually driving up Giant's Despair. This is the cup that Disbro got for driving her car up Giant's Despair, which must have really annoyed her. Uh, now, the reliability run was something else. Now, the, the press car um, was supposed to lead the way. Well, Joan went faster than anybody else and to the first stop. And when she got there, she took all the people in her car to the nearby racetrack and did a bunch of hot laps with her passengers in the car. They didn't really have a choice. And you, you never hear with those people how they felt about being whirled around a track in, a, in an open car at 50 or 60 miles an hour. And she got, they cens censored her for doing that. So this is some of the things they saw on the way, passing a horse and a wagon and going through the water. And this is one of the rare pictures of Joan and her husband. Look at the body language. They're not touching. Here she is with Disbro. You could tell who she's close to. The, the young woman on this side over here is uh, Mildred Schwalbach. She became a taxi driver in New York City, another female motorista. So um, this was the uh, promotional booklet that Rainier wrote, uh, published about this reliability run, and uh, has a lot of information about Joan in it. And, uh, she was also featured in the Weed Tire Chain book. Now, we don't really use chains anymore, maybe in Alaska, ice road truckers and all that. Uh, but in 1905, you needed a whole bunch of chains. And, and I think they made about 25 or 30 different kinds of chains for sand, chains for mud, chains for this, chains for that. And she was in there. Here is a, this is the telegram. Uh, she sent them after the 1908 <clears throat> Glidden tour where she got a perfect score. And so they put her in the book along with Harry Houdini, who also evidently used weed tire chains. So uh, you can see that uh, she was very famous to be considered in the same booklet with Houdini. Now, this was her last race car, the Knox Giantess, that she bought when she didn't know that women would be banned. She never got to race it. Um, her creepy husband is hiding back there. And this is the president, the other fellow is the president of the company. Um, she was so excited, but it just wasn't going to happen. Now, Disbro, of course, becomes a racer on his own. And he, um, and she knows a lot of the men that race and they like her. So they let her drive their cars. And she got to drive a Pope Hummer on the track, and she set the speed limit. Um, I want to say it, it was 111. It says 111 miles an hour on the trophy. And she did another one that was 112 something. Uh, beautiful trophy, too. And, uh, here she is in yet another new car. This is a Renault American. And she wrote a test, there she is in a testimonial, same picture, um, and, and telling the people out there, this is a very expensive car, 5,800 to 68 for the touring car. It's a lot of money at this time. 
Um, here she is in Wilmington, Vermont. She went, they asked her to come to Home Week and she did a hot lap through the town and uh, about 70 miles an hour. And then she let her daughter get behind the wheel. Her daughter was fearless, but unfortunately, because she was deaf, she couldn't do some of the things. Um, I'll briefly about other women racers. Um, Joan really had no serious women rivals in the US. A few of the more interesting ones, Alice Bird Potter, or Birdie as she was called, uh, was an eccentric spinster who had a lot of money and loved cars and working on them, but she didn't really care to race. Now, Alice Hyler Ramsey also married a wealthy guy. She was 22. Maxwell hired her, sponsored her to drive across the country with three other women. Of course, there were a couple support cars that went along with them. They weren't exactly on their own. Uh, but she didn't like to race. The only one, I think, that was in the same league was Dorothy Levitt, um, a British woman who was the I want to say the, the mistress of uh, Selwyn Edge, who is the head of uh, Napier Cars, and she, he groomed her to race. It turned out she was really good at it, and so she did have some success racing against men. So there's, there's Dorothy Levitt, and there's Bertie, and there's Bertie in her garage. I said she was eccentric. And there's Alice uh, going by her Maxwell. Um, what really bugs me about Alice, she was, a, she was a nice person, I'm sure. She lived a long life and uh, wrote about her experiences. The AAA selected her as woman driver of the century. And personally, Joan should be the woman driver of the century. But unfortunately, Joan moved to the upper peninsula of Michigan and died before she reached 60 and was totally forgotten. So, you know, life is not always fair. I mean, so what happens in, between 1909 and the post-war, World War II years? Women raced, but mostly in uh, very dangerous events that were more spectacle than sport. Uh, women flew and crashed and killed themselves. They fell off airplanes. Uh, a woman named Elfrida Mace drove her car through flaming obstacles for about 10 years until she hit the obstacle wrong and burned to death. Uh, and there were a lot of others. Um, Pat and I have been uh, talking about, you know, we both been kind of looking, but I'll leave it to you. And if I find somebody, I'll pass it on. Um, life after racing, what did Joan do? Well, Andrew continued to travel. By now we know that he's fooling around. He's got, like a sailor, he's got a woman in every town he visits practically. And he makes the mistake of setting up the showgirl uh, actress, if you will. Uh, and she believes that he's going to marry her. And of course, he doesn't want to marry her. I mean, there's a big lawsuit. And he says, well, how could you think I could marry you when everyone knows I'm married to this famous woman auto racer? Well, anyway, uh, she was discredited, but that was it for Joan. She divorced him. She eventually moved to Ontonaga, Michigan, where her childhood sweetheart, the guy she didn't marry, was the manager of a paper mill. Her son moved there, too, and uh, worked for this, the childhood sweetheart. Um, Disbro would race for about 30 more years and married about uh, three more times and ended up a racing official. Cuneo remarried and uh, he said he was bankrupt, but somehow he could live in a large apartment on Park Avenue uh, and he seemed to own all this property in, in the slums that were a little Italy that is now Chinatown. So her children married, but only her son had children, and uh, none of them are racers. So she married James Francis Sickman in 1928. She threw herself into civic works for a small community. 
and it is a small community. She worked with the scouts. She brought an airport to Antonagin, but she got sick, and she was never sick, maybe the flu, and died after a week's illness at 58. It, it was really sad because, you know, this is a picture of Antonagin in 1938. It's actually a lot busier than it is now because we were up there a couple of years ago. This is such a sad picture. This is Joan in her 50s and, you know, her hair is white. She's wearing a little house dress, you know. Now, I guess my purpose is to bring recognition to Joan because she really deserves it. I mean, a few places have started to recognize her, but she really needs a lot more. Uh, she shouldn't be remembered as a woman who got women banned from racing. Although, if I hadn't read that, I wouldn't have gotten started on my research. So, just a recent things, I got a dust, a pictures of a duster that she wore that one of her Newton cousins found in a trunk. And I have a picture of that. And then last year, um, Don Smith, who's the Ormond Beach historian, we had a visit there. He said, oh no, Joan was never at the beach. I said, yes, she, she was at the beach. And he was nice enough to say that he found an article that placed her at the beach, although um, she, was, she was in an extravaganza that featured four airplanes, a blimp, and Joan Newton Cuneo. And that tells you a little bit about what women who wanted to race were reduced to after they were banned. So, it's a picture of the duster. Back views. You can see how small she is. And this, I'm going to end with this. this to me, it's a really funny story. Um, she and her husband were out to dinner with a couple of bankers. And they had, one of them had ordered squab, which is sort of a small pigeon. And her husband said, my wife can eat more squab than any person I know. And so they made a bet for $200. And darn it, if she didn't eat more squab <laughs> than anybody else at the table. So Andrew actually had this trophy made um, as a winner in the squab eating contest. So not all of her trophies were automotive. And I, I kind of think, yep, there's the, from the Knox catalog, that's the, the Knox raceabout, which became her winning car. Picture of her with her son in 1918. You, you can see that she's looking more matronly. And then what came of all my research in the book. So. Thank you for being a good audience. We get out of that light. Okay. When uh, the AAA banned women from racing, yeah. was that widely publicly? Oh, known? yes, yes. It was in all the newspapers. Well, that's a good question, and I didn't really mention it, but let me get away from this uh, light. <laughs> um, it was really the idea of the auto manufacturers to ban women, because the image of women at that time, you know, women and children first, think of the Titanic, somehow women were gentler, they, they had to be protected, and they were afraid that if women were killed in auto races or dismembered, which happened a lot, uh, that it would turn people away from automobiles. So they went to the AAA, which of course depended on the auto industry, right? Because that's what they're all about. And they put the pressure on them, and it was very secret. I looked and looked. It was, that was one of the hardest things for me to find out just why they banned women. But I did find out enough information to satisfy myself that it had been pressured by the auto manufacturers because they didn't want women to be killed and injured in racing. So that's, that's why. Okay. 
Well, they were. They kicked out. Yeah. They kicked out Barney Oldfield because he. He didn't follow their rules. Yeah, you, he ran a match race against Jack Johnson because Jack Johnson, the prize fighter, said that he was a better race car driver than Barney Oldfield. Right. So they had a match race in New York, and then Barney was reduced for the next couple of years of doing these exhibitions where he'd show up and set a speed record or you know, do something. And Imka, and too. He, he also. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he did. The AAA, um, you know, they felt that what he did was bad for, bad for sports and looked, you know. You're right. And, it, and if AAA, uh, as they had this thing, is if you were a AAA driver, you couldn't drive in any other racing league either. So Oldfield didn't really care. And um, he, he would do pretty much what he wanted. And then he would come back and they they'd slap his wrist and take him back because he was a big draw, you know. So, yeah, they were big. You know, if you didn't play by their rules, you were out. In, in a way, it's kind of like, dare I say, NASCAR, if they don't like you. Because really, NASCAR benefits when AAA decides in the, in the 50s to get out of racing. NASCAR is just starting to come up. And in fact, Initially, as I recall, NASCAR was a subsidiary of AAA or a, a, one of the AAA uh, racing leagues. And then when the AAA left, then NASCAR had a golden opportunity and they stepped in. So. Did AAA ever allow uh, women to race before no. they got out of racing? No. Well, women just weren't allowed to race officially. It takes a long time. Yeah. Where did ACA stand on all this? Well, ACA, um, and I read a lot about that, too. Um, in, in the beginning, there was the ACA and the AAA. And the ACA was uh, more uh, really upper, upper class. And the AAA was more middle class. And they duked it out over who was going to control auto racing in the United States, and eventually the AAA one in that duel because they were just more middle class people <laughs> you know <laughs> but it did start out i mean if you think about the the early automobile guys they're they're mostly wealthy or if they're women i mean joan what allowed her to to do all this was her husband had a lot of money and of course he didn't really care what she wanted to do and he wanted her to be busy and so he would just get her another car. She had about 18. Unfortunately, I've never been able to find one. I, you know, I've tried. I've, I've gone to, you know, any, a lot of places. The, the one person I haven't been able to get in touch with is Jay Leno, <laughs> because he does have a white steam car just like the one she drove. But unfortunately, I don't have any access to him. Um, it, it could even be hers, for all we know, although her cars were beat up. And, uh, you know, that Knox, that would be a great find. But the, I, I was in touch with the, the guy from the, who was the president of the Knox Car Club, and he said, no, they haven't found Joan's cars. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, uh, manuals and material about car numbers and models and, and who bought whom because it, it wasn't that big. They weren't making 500,000 cars, anything like that. It was a relatively small amount. So yeah, I would love to find one of her cars, but no. Trophies, yes. And the sad thing about the trophies is, um, like in, in many families, there was a split between um, Jones, <clears throat> uh, sons, children, a boy and a girl, both adopted. The boy got everything. The girl got a mausoleum in New York. And the person who told me about the family was the daughter. But it's her brother's family that had the memorabilia, and there's supposed to be a scrapbook, which would be great, although I, there's, I don't think I need it anymore, but... Uh, 
the trophies, the, one of the great granddaughters is, has put them up at auction. And I always go through the, you know, Google Joan just to see if something pops up and these trophies popped up. And when I get home, I'm going to call the auction house because Jenny and I were thinking maybe if they haven't sold them, they hadn't, that maybe that she could contact the great-granddaughters, like they could get a tax deduction. A place like this would be perfect for the trophies, you know. So we'll see. Okay? Oh, yeah. I. Oh yeah, uh, we w we actually went up there, and uh, well, there's quite a bit, and the, the house was there, and uh, we saw where she lived, and we w you know went to the places, the things that she was involved in, and we met uh, now her her granddaughter uh, was too young to know her, but. Uh, she had quite a reputation there as being someone who was very civic minded. And of course, she had a car, had the first car in Ontonagon. Not a surprise. So, yeah, there, that's easy. Uh, she was there until she died. And then her son and sent her body to, back to the Newton plot in Massachusetts, so she is not buried in Ontonaga. She's buried in Holyoke, which I think is kind of sad because maybe if she'd been buried in Ontonaga, there, there might have been um, more recognition of what she had done because they knew her as the civic-minded person, not as the lady racer. And this much in the New York Times, aren't you? So a bit. Historians, you know, we always look for the abyss. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Well, let me get myself out of here. back on.
five minutes are up. Um, I'm going to introduce the next two speakers um, who um, are both speaking on women racers. And our first speaker is, is a gentleman we have already met, many of us have already met. Um, Francis Clax spoke at last year's uh, Argent Singer Symposium. And he spoke on and also displayed part of his, I think, unusual collection. It was unusual to me, collection of early automobile engine temperature gauge artifacts called motometers. And Francis is known, in fact, as the actually the world's greatest authority on the motometer. Um, he's internationally recognized. He um, is a collector, uh, an expert. Uh, he has generously loaned uh, his collections to various uh, auto museums. He's been a guest speaker um, at many conferences and conventions, uh, sponsored by uh, automotive and automobilia organizations. Um, his publications appear in Antique Auto Club of America's magazine, in our SAH journal, in Italy's Automobile Society International magazine, uh, La Mano Vela, and uh, in an upcoming uh, issue of SAH's Automotive History Review. But before all of this, he graduated from Boston's Northeastern University and worked in financial investment for the federal government and in television. He competed um, as a super bike class road racer. He owns and manages what he described as the wildly popular <laughs> uh, automobile, automobilia website, www.motormetercentral.com. Um, and his extensive collection, this is his, his uh, next project, his extensive collection of the motometers will be the featured exhibition at the Ontario uh, County Auto Historical uh, Society in New York from what, February through September, September, February 2nd through September 8th, 2018. So, um, of course, I'm interested in the road from modem years to uh, an ETA, so you better tell us, or tell me anyway. So Francis Claps. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. For those of you who are you know, catching this on live stream, we have braved, and this audience has have braved some pretty chilly ar Arctic weather, snow yesterday and 19 degrees this morning. Not, not uh, Miami weather by any, any stretch of the imagination and quite cold still. But um, I appreciate all of you who came out. We appreciate that very much. I want to also make sure that it's clear that, you know, I'm, uh, again, very, very sincere and deeply moved to be able to be here again this year. I do thank very much, you know, the sacrifices and contributions made by the Argent Singer family to enable us to have this opportunity and to be here, to have the great facilities that we've had, and um, to have shared all that so much with the, the greater public as well as to us. I think that's one of the first things. So I really appreciate very much. I thank all the speakers who came last year and have you know, reappeared this year. I really want to also very much obviously thank the IMRRC 
for its efforts to continue to promote automotive history and automotive racing history in particular because there's really not a lot of good coverage over about that particular subject in general. And I appreciate again all of the all of us who, you know, take a real keen interest in you know, really, really exploring obscure history and, and making sure that some folks are not for dot forgotten who, who, you know, are indeed important and do, you know, contribute in the, the larger sense to, you know, to uh, what is a, a current state of, you know, of understanding of automotive technology, automotive racing history and history itself. Okay, my um, particular topic of uh, a biography on French woman racer Anne Cecile Rose Itier um, kind of got started as from basically as soon as as uh, the seminar the symposium ended last year, I walked over to the IMRRC uh, facility and I saw a picture of Anne, and she happened to have on her car a motor meter that's really really not the typical type that you would see on your car. Or on a racing car, as um, as the normal engine temperature gauge itself, and that you know that sort of you know caught my attention to say the least. I tried for this, you know. So again, so let me just also say that you know for um, you know this presentation you know is easily a year old, and um, you know stemmed from you know a small photo, which you know had a little bit of what I was doing before. But yet, I mean, this particular um, individual really, really captured my, my attention. And I tried a little bit to, to not necessarily seek to present her biography for this particular seminar. I, I looked at you know, several other, maybe even a half dozen to a dozen other potential subjects, but she just kept coming back and back. And I really just kept finding more and more information about her when there's very, very little about her out there, even on the internet. But again, sometimes history speaks through us, and some people, you know, obviously choose, sort of choose people as to who to tell their story. And, um, you know, again, I have a little bit of opportunity to help tell her story today. So I don't have Josh's help. So I'm going to try to fumble through this myself. Okay, so as you see here, this is sort of the, kind of the beginning of where my, my paper kind of starts. A little collage here of, of Anne in, in various racing forms. Anne began her racing career in the mid-1920s, primarily starting in hill climb after she famously got divorced from a very, very tumultuous relationship with a gentleman who, used to, who was a drunkard and, and beat her, just severely beat her constantly. So she was able to, as I later found out just prior to print, was that uh, she had indeed you know, gotten divorced, but that she acquired a bit of money from that, you know, which she bought a race car similar to this um, 1923 to 26 circa Razier uh, TB4 car. She competed in this as her first racing event in a Paris to Powell road racing or road rally event. She won first place. So you see it's a big car. Obviously perfect for, for hill climb. Here again is a 1920s race. She's in a Bugatti at this point and she seems to have certainly have at least completed the course. It is uh, it is known that on June 20 or excuse me June 2nd 1929 that she did finish second in a Bugatti type 37 in a hill climb. And sort of uh, kind of famously became known as um, due to some derogatory statements about her being a so-called mobile chicane. 
you know, we've all heard that term or so if you've ever been involved in racing because it's inevitable. You're going to be that way to start when you don't have the hot equipment and you don't know the tracks and you don't have the experience. But it was, it was really unwarranted. And largely, if you do triangulate a bit on who is, who is, you know, largely dishing out many, many disparaging comments about Anne and about women in general in racing at that point in time, you can pretty much figure out who it was. I will not bother to <clears throat> tell you at all who I believe the evidence most, you know, you know, most pointingly um, it would seem to be, but... Nonetheless, um, so here you see again, you know, where the previous chart showed that there, of all these, of all these car entrants, again, we see a number who did not appear. Anne's name is there as one of those who did under number 16, right there. And here in the same race, we see the uh, final results. And we do see Anne's name here under a number three position in the finals. So she podiumed, had pretty good time compared to everybody else. She wasn't necessarily, you know, as fast as, you know, finishing the course off in two hours and 15 minutes. But she certainly was there. <coughs> we see, again, there are a number of racers here who are male racers who finished below where she was. So much for being a, chic a chicane. And later in her career was able to, like many women of that period in time, was able to race airplane, race against airplanes. She had originally started her career racing airplanes or aeroplanes at that time. And, you know, was able to parlay a little bit of a uh, career by racing them at, you know, obviously sort of festival kind of events, spectator events for daredevils. And we see her name here listed as being now called Madame, giving her some credit and status. Um, in this particular photo, this sort of explains, this is the photo that I found from, taken from Zoltan Glass, wherein this is the, the motor meter or temperature gauge that she used. This is um, from, this gauge itself is, is typical of a 1932 Boyce motor meter gauge. And again, I've never ever seen this particular gauge listed on, or, or excuse me, shown on any other race car other than here. And this is what piqued my interest in, in Anne. And this particular gauge was also one that I had brought with me last year. And Dr. Young had picked it up and she found a lot of fascination with, sort of with it. So it was kind of, you know, nice to sort of have that connection. <clears throat> But again, we do see that Anne is a full-fledged race car driver. She's in the pits. She's getting congratulated by some form of a, some woman who's probably some sort of a dignitary. Okay, here we see her in a Bugatti. And indeed, you know, here's, here's another one of my uh, signature little motor meter devices. This is one of the French ones. This Bugatti, I believe, is probably a, 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 a Type 37. She primarily campaign type 37 turbocharged versions of this uh, you know, 1.1 liter machine. Here we see her, her car, and then here in the circle, of course, is her sort of trademark purse that was never ever all that far away from her. So Anne, you know, never, never lost her femininity in the process of still being an automobile racer. I love her, her um, cock to the side goggles, not, not perfect. So again, here we see her leaving her car from one of the uh, sort of race pit, probably pit areas. And you know, she's got her goggles, she's got her boots, she's got you know, a rag to wipe, wipe down her car, wipe off, use as an oil, you know, oil dipstick you know, cleaner, but she's got that pocketbook there too. But clearly, you can see she's focused on racing. This photo is probably, again, from the 30s. A 
Okay, here I, I decided that you know what I'd like to do is also is make sure again we are, you know we know the pa the true past and we know we are informed that you know there were people who were racing a whole lot earlier than you know the ladies of the 30s and even you know ladies of the early kind of you know very early <clears throat> single digit 20th century dates first that I show here is again Camille Dugast Camille was um she came from sort of an affluent background wherein she had married into a very rich family. So therefore she had access to getting cars early on at the turn of the century. Here again, we see her, you know, obviously in the full race regalia. Yeah, so we do see again that uh, Cecile is at the is at the uh, wheel, and her male riding mechanic is, is the guy who's, who's, you know, who is not the driver. So obviously this sort of looks, you know, from the dust cloud from behind, we can see that this sort of really looks again like she's in either in full motion or has just come to a stop. Or else that's a pretty good, that would be a pretty good camera shot because the wheels are not in motion. Okay, here she's in a much more staged sort of shot. But we do see, again, the same 29 car, circa 1910. Again, here is our male, who is uh, the riding mechanic and not the driver. This is a, a, a picture of Anne in the late 1800s. And you can see uh, that A, she was regarded as, as the most beautiful woman in Paris, green-eyed, fair-haired, with a shapely corseted figure, a wicked sense of humor, and an irresistible smile, according to the Ballou, Ballou Museum blog site. Anne was one of the first people to um, parachute out of, a, out of a balloon in 1895. As I said, she came from a, you know, a w very wealthy, well, she came from a wealthy family and married into, you know, married a merchant who was very, very wealthy. Or excuse me, Camille, sorry. And uh, Camille was also an accomplished fencer, skier, rifle and pistol shot, horse trainer, concert pianist, and singer. She, again, was a hot air balloonist. And again, in 1895, jumped from a, a height of 2,000 feet with a parachute. So it's really, really strange for someone who's aristocratic to be doing you know, those kinds of activities. So clearly, she was a force to be reckoned with and quite a persona in and of herself. She is one of the first three women to ever race in an automobile or motor, you know, a true sort of motor speed oriented event. Here again is another one of those photos. Again, we have her riding mechanic there in his beaver skin coat, beaver fur coat. Again, even in this particular photo, again, we see that Cecile does not look, or excuse me, um, Camille does not look all that different from the previous photos. Here we have Baroness, Helene von Zulin. She married into, she was already again wealthy and she married into um, a very, very rich family itself. She was actually part of the Rothschild banking family and dynasty. Of course, they still exist today. She married a baron in 1887 and became a baroness. She was, uh, was wealthy and affluent, and she could afford a, a motor car also back then. In 1901, she entered a race from Paris to Berlin. And along with Camille, Dugas was one of the, was one of the only other female, of, female entrants of 122 starters.
there really aren't, you know, any other photos other than this particular one that I know of, of this particular individual. Here we have the Duchess de Uses and de roche de Mort, de Mortemart. Again, another rich, affluent person who was able to afford a car. She's one of the first clients of Emile Delahaye, and she's also the first woman to ever acquire a driver's license. And here there's a depiction of her essentially inspecting her car prior to taking a driver's test. Here she is a little later with her driving companion, again a male. So these three ladies, Camille, Helene, and Anne, are the three you know, actual female pioneers of, of automobile racing. And again, you're, you'd be really, really hard pressed to find you know, pretty much anywhere where they're, where they're given that kind of credit or talked about. So here we have Elizabeth Junik, otherwise born as Aliska Junkova. She is known as uh, the queen of the steering wheel. And largely, again, she primarily raced with her husband and on occasion because he was, had been injured in, I think, in the war, was able to take over driving responsibilities from time to time and drive on her own in races. And so that helped to bolster her career. Here we have a collage of Ellie Nice photos. Ellie is, you know, was made sort of famous and immortalized by the book Bugatti Queen. She wasn't, you know, she was, you know, basically successful in pretty much one race, and that was a race in which it was an all women's race, and she set a, a women's speed record. But if you, you know, if you look at the internet, they will, you know, kind of lead you to believe that you know, she had raced against men and that this is a real, you know, I don't want to say not a real world record, but that essentially it was the world record for speed, which just wasn't true. Ellie Nice also had a fairly dubious past as to how she kind of came into racing and acquired cars. I don't necessarily want to go into all of that, but let's just say again that it, there are certain people who worked very, very hard and were truly, truly passionate about racing versus Ellie and East. If you look at every one of these photos, you'll notice, you know, take this one on here on the right. I mean, she's on, this is on a starting grid and she's powdering her face ready for her close up. Only problem is Mr. DeMille wasn't there, but there was obviously some other photographer. Here she's again, once again, posing, posing, posing. And the photos like that just continue to go on and on and on. She was very much a uh, sort of an exploiter and, you know, someone who was always publicity seeking. I do actually have a, a photo of, of L.A. Nice actually driving, but I didn't include it here. But it's, it's pretty much uh, the, rare, the rarest of the rare to find that particular photo of her just simply racing or non-posing. So why did I include that particular photo, or, or excuse me, the inclusion of Ellie Nice and of Elizabeth? I did so because, again, they were sort of the contemporaries of, of Anne Cecile, Rose Itier. But yet they got more publicity, and Anne, who just kept her head down and raced, really you know, was just simply overlooked because she wasn't flamboyant. She, she was known, however, to, to race and use pink overalls, and again, as you saw in some of the photos, she was constantly someone who had her, her handbag right there. And again, as it kind of tried to indicate that particular moto meter that you saw with sort of the art deco approach was pretty bold in my opinion because I don't think any other racer could have gotten away with using that versus the round, typical round type that you see. 
I mean, I certainly wouldn't have been so bold to be able to do that. Call it a macho thing or whatever, but that's the way it is. If there's any guy, any guy here who would probably put something like that on your car, feel free. Hold your hand up and let me know. Okay, here, so we see Ann over here in the corner. And we see a Bugatti like the one that she, uh, she raised, the T37A. The, the A versus the, the 37, I, I'm told, is again that the A version was turbocharged. Output probably in and around the 50 horsepower kind of range. And it was very much, again, the light, a light class racing car. And she proved, again, pretty, you know, pretty much you know, successful in the car, relatively speaking. You know, she definitely finished the races, which you've got to finish first, you know, or you've got to finish you know, first and foremost. Here I tried to provide at least a little image that you know encapsulates some of her career. That may not be very, very clear given the blow up. But you see again, you know, here we, we have her in, you know, in uh, 1929. Here we're you know we're talking about her still racing by 37, so she was a little bit of a force. Here again, the uh, this particular frame image shows uh, or states again that she, you know she did race in the Le Mans 24 hour. And she did that from 35 to 37. So she's getting on a little bit here in age and time. Okay, here we see her Le Mans finish or race entries. She never won at Le Mans, but how many of us have or did? And again, we see here's a pretty good extensive career from being able to, to do that at 35, or from 35 to 39 as her last, her last date. In some cases here, again, you know, she is listed as the entrance and entrant, and then here are her co-drivers. So there's a name that, again, some folks should remember, or is Charles Doray from American, you know, Grand Prix or American IndyCar racing. American Speedway Racing. So here's our la one of our last images that we have of Ann. Ann unfortunately passed away in 1980. She's buried in France. And part of the, you know, my real reason for choosing her was that although it's stated that she was quote unquote rich, I don't think, you know, she was certainly Rothschild banking industry or family level rich. She, she wasn't necessarily like as affluent as some of those earliest ladies. And she also, again, was sort of part of the democratization of I think of racing, that's how at least I look at her, as she was kind of, you know, regular people getting a car and following her passion all the way through as far as she could. And very much, you know, putting down that statement that she was a, a, just a, a sheer chicane out there. She could race. Later, or excuse me, during the, the uh, World War II effort, she was a member of the French resistance and was credited as have, having saved and, and helped um, many, many children be, be removed from occupied France. So she lived a very, very storied life. Eventually, she did, or well, while racing, she did um, have an encounter in Morocco where she was lost in a dust storm and a so-called, you know, debonair gentleman came to her aid and he helped her out. They later married. He became a press director for Porsche. So you could sort of say, I guess, that she did have a uh, 
happy ending at the end. Excuse me. Again, and my reason for, again for choosing her was so much so that she kept her head down, she raced, she was a driver, she was a racer. She wasn't someone seeking publicity, not fame, she wanted to race. And she did that, and she, I thought she was very, very successful, and her record shows that. Thank you very, very much. Oh, is there any questions? Yes, yes, Glenda. When you were doing your research about all women drivers of that era, did you find any evidence of American women going to Europe to race? No evidence of, of any American, not a single American woman uh, did I find, you know, in that period of pre, certainly the pre-war era. I did not, did not try to seek after that. And mostly what I found was that during the pre-war era, most women were involved, certainly during the 20s, were involved in cycle car racing. So, you know, we're talking very much small CC, small, you know, low horsepower, you know, engines. And in fact, uh, I have some photos of Barney Oldfield and his wife, Barney officiating in Oldfield and his wife uh, having won a few races. You know, mostly again, we, it's the uh, you know the county fair kind of sort of situ situation set up. Nothing real serious. And as our previous speakers already said, that you know women were pretty much banned from racing, so that's a really unfair advantage and sets back the growth and development of of racing and, and certainly women racing. Okay. <clears throat> yes, Pat. Dita, you know, again, I'm not, I guess I probably, I didn't want to go into that much of, of Ellie Nice. However, you know, the, as you say, you know, she was a dancer. There are almost more, more photos and, <clears throat> excuse me, more photos of her as, essentially, you know, in, disrobed versus, you know, well, what people like is certainly, you know, I've never seen one of, of, of uh, Ralph De Palma that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. They did a Le Mans race. They crashed out. It's, n it's not clear exactly who was driving, but they crashed out. Well, they never drove together after that. Yeah, no. So I don't know, maybe, who knows, maybe they were fighting over who was getting in the car. Or, I doubt, again, in that situation, it would be a matter of who's, gonna, who's driving. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's no question, you know, that Nice's reputation, if you will, that, you know, is that, again, she obtained a Bugatti car as a result of her relationship with uh, Itori's uh, brother, Jean who, 
excuse me, son, who helped her to parlay her way into a car. I believe she bought her cars. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Well, the, um, they were, cycle cars were very much underpowered in comparison. They also did not necessarily go up to 1,100 cc's. They weren't, you know, again, a cycle car, you could pretty much, you know, pull an engine out of anything and essentially go racing with a little body. Ford cars, you know, were, no, were known for being made into cycle cars. Horsepower of a cycle car is probably in around, you know, anywhere from 25 to 45 horses versus 50 to 65 to 70, non-turbocharged. I would imagine that that's probably the biggest, one of the biggest differences between the two. And also again, that the Europeans just didn't race them at that, at that stage of the game. Okay, anyone else? So again, I thank everybody. I also wanna thank my neighbor, Rob Graminski for coming out. He's wearing Ferrari red, and I'm hoping that again tomorrow when we watch Formula One racing, he will be red again. And he, and he knows why I'm saying that. Francis found a motor, motor meter on Anne Itier's car, and that took him to a whole new, new project. So let's see what motivates Jeremy here. I'm going to introduce um, our final speaker, uh, Dr. Jeremy Kinney, uh, who is a curator in the aeronautic, aeronautics department of the Smithsonian uh, National Air and Space Museum. Uh, Jeremy has a PhD in the history of technology from Auburn University. Um, his research focuses on the technical development of aviation in the United States and Europe during the 20th century, um, which includes his latest book, Congratulations, uh, Reinventing the Propeller, colon, academics like colons, Reinventing the Propeller, Aeronautical Specialty and the Triumph of the Modern Airplane. And, um, that's published by Cambridge University Press this year, 2017. Uh, Jeremy's research interests also include motorsports in the United States and Europe through his current work on the cultural history of the sports car in post-World War II America. Um, his essay, Sports Car Paradise, colon, Racing in Los Angeles for the forthcoming anthology, LA Sports Play, LA Sports, colon, Play, Games, and Community in the City of Angels. Um, and published by the University of Arkansas Press will appear in 2018. 
his article, Racing on the Runways, colon, the Strategic Air Command, all my articles have colons, the Strategic Air Command and Sports Car Racing in the 1950s appeared in the journal ICON in 2013, I-C-O-N. Uh, Jeremy is also the lead curator of, uh, on the planned National Air and Space Museum exhibition, Nation of Speed, uh, which will examine how Americans shape their lives and their world by embracing time and distance, shattering technologies for everyday travel and commerce, motorsports competition, including sports cars, and seizing the high ground during the Cold War. So, I give to you, Jeremy. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, uh, happy Veterans Day. And I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Society of Automotive Historians and the uh, International Motor Racing Research Center for being showing all the hospitality is, uh, for this very great conference, and I've enjoyed all the papers. And thank you for letting me present some of my research. In 1963, Donna Mae Mims became the first woman in the history of the Sports Car Club of America, the SCCA, to win a national racing championship. Wearing a pink helmet and coveralls and driving a pink Austin Healey Sprite, she beat 30 men for the title. Created in 1944, the SCCA was a male-dominated amateur racing organization that wanted to continue a pre-war motorsports tradition that looked to Europe as its major influence. It also wanted to galvanize the surge for enthusiasm for English, Italian, and German performance cars in post-World War II America. In response, affluent Americans, some of them part of a growing middle class, went racing. A small percentage of these, women, of these enthusiasts were women. Historians have addressed the themes of automobiles and motorsports as rooted in technological enthusiasm from the perspective of the post-war United States. Robert Post's important study of drag racing has shown the cultural value of analyzing a dramatic theater of machines that has no practical purpose. The participatory phenomenon of hot rodding, according to David Lusco, is an important example of how end user agency opened up the black box of the automobile. John Heitman recognized the influence of European sports cars and racing in 1950s America at the recreational level. These pastimes were overwhelmingly male-oriented and studying the boys and their toys, as Roger Hortz and the authors of the volume of the same name provided, has revealed the value of integrating gender into the history of technology. A case study of women in sports cars illustrates how deeply play and leisure were interwoven with gender, class, and technology in 1950s and 1960s America. This paper delves into the story of women caught up in a transatlantic movement centered on sports car racing. Their technological enthusiasm offered an alternative lifestyle and experience counter to the, to the expectations and stereotypes of their male counterparts, as well as mainstream America overall. Building upon the work of Virginia Scharf, Georgine Clarkson and Deborah Clark on women motorists, Jennifer Hargreaves on fem female athletes, and Nina Lerman, Ruth Oldenziel, and Arwen Mahoon on the socially constructed interrelationship between technology and gender, this talk discusses the paradoxical roles of women in the world of sports car competition regarding whether they were to be perceived as active participants or as automotive ornamentation. But first of all, let's deal with a major point of terminology. What is a sports car? A common definition would characterize one as a two-seater, light and weight, with, fat, with a fast pickup, and quick brakes. Above all else, a sports car needed good cornering abilities that gave it the road-hugging ability to take a curve at high speed without turning over. In other words, a sports car was to be driven for the sheer sport of driving. They originated in Europe in the late 1930s, where enthusiast manufacturers built them for the continents winding network of old-fashioned roads for a demanding sporting community. If sports cars are European, then how do they come to the United States? The well-heeled got into sports cars first in the late 1930s due to their rarity and cost. 
they strove to emulate the spectacles they saw in European racing circuits such as Le Mans, Nürburgring, and Brooklands. On a larger scale, American military personnel discovered sports cars in Europe during World War II. They were enthralled by their speed and agility as they navigated the short distances and arcane winding roads of the English, as well as the, some other countries, uh, countrysides. During the summer of 1947, the first shipments of MGT series sports cars from Great Britain arrived in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and other cities, numbering over 200 in all. The MGTC, with its long front fenders, bulbous headlights, and tall rectangular radiator, and the steering wheel installed on the right side of the car, symbolized the first wave of sports cars. Time magazine asserted that a reason for the enthusiasm for sports cars and racing them reflected an epidemic, a veritable nationwide hankering for speed and excitement at all levels of society and types of participation. Before World War II, the airplane enthralled America with its global promise of adventure. After the war, Time noted, drivers, spectators, mechanics, designers, engineers, even high school students and middle-aged entrepreneurs, both male and female, all caught what Time called the damn bug. European manufacturers marketed a variety of cars to a newly affluent middle class, America, which ensured that a sports car lifestyle was possible. The need for, the, excuse me, the need for speed, so to speak, and racing sports cars in the United States existed long before the 1950s. As soon as the automobile appeared in the US, the super rich that could afford them transferred the spirit of racing horses and yachts to their new possessions. The Vanderbilt Cup races held on Long Island, New York, soon became the sport of millionaires and a new class of professional race car drivers. Large crowds, numbering upwards of 50,000 people reportedly, lined the roads to watch the first race in 1904. Privileged women were part of this first generation of automobile racers. Uh, Janet Newton uh, Cuneo, which we learned about from Elsa, was a successful competitor equal in skill to the legendary Ralph De Palma. She had one challenge that De Palma did not. Victorian stereotypes portrayed women as unable to handle difficult situations, needing protection from the world and from, from themselves for that matter. Concerned over that increasing number of women participating, the uh, AAA, the American Automobile Association, banned women from sanctioned competition. As women found less opportunity in automotive competition, a small group of affluent male enthusiasts wanted to emulate the European racing tradition. The Automobile Racing Club of America, or ARCA, formed to revive road racing in 1933, but World War II cut their activities short. While the rest of the world was embroiled in a global war, a group of well-to-do and those enthusiasts, many of them from ARCA, formed the SCCA in Boston in February 1944. Due to the all-male and privileged car-owning membership, the SCCA quickly became known as the Gentleman's Club, and they were all-male, primarily all-Christian, and all-white. After the war, the SCCA began to sanction road racing in October 1948 with the inauguration of the first International Sports Car Grand Prix at Watkins Glen. In reviving American road racing, they wanted to continue the pre-war tradition of racing in the U.S., bring sports car racing to a level of popularity equal to what was found in Europe, and to galvanize the, the surge of enthusiasm for two-seat European performance cars imported into the United States. Despite those aspirations, in 1952, the larger American racing community considered the approximately 5,000 members of the SCCA a group of wealthy, quote, amateurs with expensive little foreign cars. The sports car movement and racing came together in the immediate post-war period to become a popular spectator sport, excuse me, sport in the United States. At the Florida National Sports Car Races on February 21, 1953, an unprecedented 90,000 people crowded MacDill Air Force Base near Tampa to see their favorite drivers operating exotic racing cars. Now on the surface, it appeared that women only filled their expected role providing ornamentation for automobiles. Program covers, beauty queens, and support positions crucial to club activities conveyed a sense that women played a secondary supportive role, pit bunny or pit wife, and certainly not as competitive drivers. To appease the women who did want to race, SCCA organizers allowed special ladies races or powder puff derbies. 
They were held in conjunction with, but not part of, regional and national events. While some women owned their own cars, the original premise was a wife would borrow her husband's car for a small number of laps as an entertaining prelude to the main and all-male event. For any reason, race committees could arbitrarily cancel those races or disallow female entrance in mixed events if the track was deemed too dangerous for the women. Looking to encourage increased participation, enthusiasts in California created the Women's Sports Car Club, the WSCC, in 1953. They ended up formalizing the female support role for the SCCA's high-profile races, which included lap scoring, registration and check-in, running mimeograph copies, and organizing glamorous award banquets for the male winners. Well, women had been operating cars in large numbers on city streets and country lanes since the 1920s, they were still viewed as exceptional on the racetrack. These drivers, operating mechanical objects with specialized techniques such as heel and toe pedal manipulation and double clutching and unsynchronized transmission, counter the stereotype that women were unable or unwilling to operate complicated machinery in a high stakes and dangerous environment. Still, we are talking about a small number here. 61 women held SCCA competition licenses in 1958, which represented less than 1% of the total membership. Another 60 or so participated without official SCCA sanction. And this is one of my favorite pictures because you can't tell if that's a, ma a male or a female. And it is a woman driving this Austin Healy in this image. One film from Hollywood in the 1950s contributed to that competitive image. In Roger Corman's The Fast and the Furious from 1955, the lives of beautiful Jaguar owner Connie Adair and escaped convict and former truck driver Frank Webster wrongfully imprisoned for murder, collided against the dramatic backdrop of a Southern California sports car race. As Webster attempts to make his way to Mexico in freedom, he is thrown into the stylish and exclusive world of sports car enthusiasts. Adair is popular with her sporty friends, financially secure, and fully capable of racing her Jaguar XK120 Roadster. The race committee's decision to ban women drivers for safety reasons uh, facilitates their budding love affair as Webster becomes her driver rather than her captor. The climatic end of the movie sees Webster winning a race that Adair could have won on her own. The, main, the mainstream image of the woman and the automobile was the homemaker and the family car. In many ways, everyday Americans could not connect with a European sports car, whether it was the technology itself or how it was used. The stiff ride was uncomfortable, no lo local mechanics supposedly had the tools or knowledge to work on them, and the lack of seating and storage space meant it could not accommodate growing family or work on the farm. A station wagon, or for the really ambitious, a Cadillac sedan, fit the ideal of the American dream better. But any car resplendent in chrome and tail fins would do. In a culture where a thrifty pioneer passed, the economic trauma of the Great Depression, and widespread rationing during World War II were in recent memory, a sports car was an impractical luxury that exuded an image of adventure, individuality, and sex appeal, especially for women. Automobile ownership was a considerable investment for many Americans who averaged only $3,000 in wages for 1954, with the overwhelming majority of that being earned by men. Moreover, it would be a decade later until American families became two-car households. A six-passenger Oldsmobile sedan or wagon cost $2,500. A novice and single female sporting enthusiast had a wide range of cars and prices from which to choose to go racing. A used MGTC could be bought for as little as $850, and if you saw that in the classifieds of road track. A brand new MG Triumph for Austin Healey cost under $3,000. For more performance and money, a prospective racer could buy a Jaguar, Corvette, or Ferrari. And you had to also throw into the purchase of the car the extra cost of racing, which was approximately $1,200 or $10,200 in modern currency. At all levels of income, sports car ownership was not cheap, which added to their exclusivity and unique appeal to those enamored with the lifestyle. One of the few women that were able to go racing in the 1950s was Evelyn Mull. She was born in New York City in 1913 
After being educated in the best boarding schools and excelling at horse riding, she married John Barnes Mull, the heir to a Pennsylvania coal fortune, and moved to Santa Fe in the late 1940s. She and her husband turned to sports car racing as a new hobby that included a lifestyle centered on fox hunting on the East Coast, coyote hunting in New Mexico, whitewater river rafting on the Colorado. Mull participated in both ladies and combined or mixed races on the Great
Uh, testing one, two, testing, check, check. Okay, I'll get I'll get started. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for rolling with it. Um, and I, I do promise I had some really great images. You'll, you'll see. <laughs> you have to use your uh, use your imagination. Um, so where I left off was introducing uh, Evelyn Mull and that image of her and her husband with their AC uh, Ace race cars was pretty. Yeah, they were at Virginia International Raceway. Uh, so that's what they did for fun when they weren't shooting coyotes or you know doing those things. But for 1957, Evelyn Mall was named the best woman race driver by the New York Times. And part of her uh, status of that, the Sports Car Press, which was a very important public, you know, they just published all different types of topics, and they published Evelyn Mall's Women in Sports Car Competition in 1958. And the questions she wanted to answer uh, with that book are, who are, Americans, who are America's women drivers of sports cars? How do they drive and why? What do they wear? And what do their husbands think about it? Mull's perspective reflected her privileged background, which at points reads like a society page, but her experience racing was common among all women drivers. She lamented, you can't win. Being a woman, you must be a poor driver, or if you're a good driver, you must be unfeminine. For the mother of three, that paradox cast a small shadow on her hobby but it did not deter her from participating until the end of the 1950s. Now, Mole's book profiled the first generation of women sports car drivers in the United States, and that's who I'd like to focus on. It revealed that they came from all walks of life as they came to racing for different reasons. Ohio Secretary Susie Dietrich learned to race from her driver husband, Chuck, and raced MG, Porsche, Sunbeam, and Shelby sports cars successfully for two decades. Sharing the hobby with her husband initially, she saw racing as both a social and competitive activity. Denise McCluggage, a sports writer for the New York Herald Tribune, aimed to reach the highest levels of professional motorsports competition. Her preference was that she would rather finish third in a mixed race than win a ladies event. Wearing her, wearing her polka dotted helmet, she raced all across the United States and Europe, which included a class win at Sebring in 1961, before embarking upon a successful career in automotive journalism. As Mull, Dietrich, and McCluggage found their way in the Gentlemen's Club of the SCCA, another racing convert was Donna Mae Mims. Born in 1927 in Pittsburgh to a middle-class family, she caught the bug when she and her husband bought a Corvette in the late 1950s. In defiance of her soon-to-be ex-husband, when she, she started racing in 1960 at the age of 33 and won her first race. She worked as the ex executive secret secretary at the famous Yenko Chevrolet dealership in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. Mims bought a used Austin Healey Sprite in 1962, and the following year she won the national championship in SCCA's H production category. And I'm gonna, I'd like to, I'll ask a question that I hopefully will answer, is that I think it's not only the first woman, Donna Mae Mims, to win a national championship in the SCCA, I think it's the first national championship in any type of racing that a woman's won. So let's talk about that in the q and if we like. Um, but how she won the championship was by the accumulation of points based on how high she finished in each race. So for, for Mim, she competed in 10 sanctioned races and placed first and two, second and three. And her fifth place finish in the last race earned her the trophy. So she was right there with the men, did the points, made those places and won the H production championship. From the start, Mims was known as the Pink Lady of Racing, which reflected both her personality and her need to navigate the male-dominated world of racing. In 1965, she stated, I do love pink. I feel and sense pink. It's a girly color. What interests me the most for the moment is that extremely hard competition with men in a very manly sport. That may be the reason it is important for me to appear as feminine as possible. Nevertheless, she was a racer first and went on to say, you cannot think nice. Chivalry is dead on the racetrack. You are out there only for one thing, to win. Nobody remembers second place. Facing the ever-present paradox that Evelyn Mole recognized, Mims used her individuality and femininity as part of her racing strategy and public persona. Now, Mims moved on to be the liaison for design and production with the sports car division at Yenko, which funded both her racing and her sports car lifestyle. 
Besides the championship winning Sprite, Mims also raced Chevrolet, Triumph, and MG sports cars. All of them painted the same color and often with Think Pink emblazoned on the back in large letters. Automotive products uh, suppliers saw the marketing or sex appeal and competitive value of Mims and equally capable women drivers. She joined the Ring Free Oil Motor Maids in 1966 and competed in high profile international events like the 12 Hours of Sebring and the Daytona Continental 24 Hour Endurance Race. Her team members included Susie Dietrich and, sh uh, and shown here, um, aerospace engineer Janet Guthrie, who became the first woman to qualify and compete in both the Indi Indianapolis 500 and the Daytona 500, later 1977, and Dutch touring car racer and actress Leanne Engeman. Now in and so the motor maids are featured in this advertising as for their sex appeal, but these are very accomplished women drivers and, and they do very well in, in what they, in, in their competitions. And that's at the racing level and the very specific internal kind of community of racing. But in contrast to the increasing number of skilled female drivers on racetracks, Hollywood in the late 19, in the 1960s and 1970s perpetuated the woman as ornament theme to mainstream viewers. Racing oriented romps starring Elvis like Viva Las Vegas, Spin Out, and epic films like Grand Prix and Le Mans portrayed women as romantic interests and nothing more. And that's a very interesting contrast to The Fast and the Furious because that's an independent film made in a matter of a few weeks in 1955 that has the woman as a racing heroine. Whereas these big budget films are really perpetuating that woman as ornament thing. Now despite the portrayal of women like Anne Margaret in Viva Las Vegas, who needs her help fixing her own sports car from Elvis. Uh, women continue to compete in the SCCA. Arlene Hiss won the 1975 showroom stock championship in an Opal sedan. Starting in 1980, Karen Babb began a remarkable career in solo or autocross competition that led to 20 national championships and her induction into the SCCA Hall of Fame in 2011. As of 2008, Women made up approximately 25% of the 61,000 members of the SCCA, which is the largest sanctioning body for car racing today, a far cry from the 5,000 members uh, from the early 1950s. Oh, and by the way, uh, Lisa Noble recently completed her tenure as SCCA president in 2016. So in conclusion, the experience of women in sports car racing reflected larger trends in the male-dominated culture of motorsports in American society in general. Overall, amateur sports car racing was the first area of motorsports in which American women gained a significant foothold and their participation expanded into dragsters, stock cars, and indie cars as the 20th century progressed. Social and financial independence proved to be gateways to individual participation, but women still faced considerable gender inequality and blanket stereotypes when it came to racing competitions and driving and owning sports cars in general. Nevertheless, women expressed their passion for their chosen motorsport as a form of leisure, and by extension, their technological enthusiasm overall. These drivers found a way to have fun driving fast cars as they sped through the masculine world of sports car racing. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Well, I have a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Sure. Uh, when you were looking into this, what were your expectations? 
Well, I had embarked upon this project about the sports car, and I felt like I needed to look at uh, gender and minorities as part of the project, so my expectation was just to get to learn what the story was. And that's what brought me to it. So, um, so I really felt like that had to be a, a, a critical component of the overall story. <coughs> and I, I think that, and we may talk about this in the panel um, discussion, but I, I didn't really have any expectations other than I wanted, I didn't know anything about it. And so this was really enlightening to see how women fit into this story. And, and so I, one of the, Two of the goals was to, let's debate whether Donna Mae Mims is the first woman to ever won a national championship. I wanted to see if people had any thoughts on that. But the other one was, is where do women fit in other motorsports disciplines? You know, because I, because uh, where do they fit in NASCAR? Where do they fit in drag racing? Is it, is this the, is this the earliest instance or sports car racing the earliest or is there other examples or simultaneous examples? Uh, just to get a little bit better of a context uh, for this this particular story. Yes. Okay, it certainly seems that some of these women were, were clearly combating what they recognized as the gender inequality of, of sports car racing. And I wonder if any of them tried to also assist other women in becoming drivers or perhaps becoming mechanics, which would knock down some of the other barriers that were supporting women in sports car racing. I don't know if I've seen that specifically in the 50s and 60s, but that probably just requires more digging. Because I think in terms of amateur racing, you usually, you can control your world a lot easier in terms of who you're going to work with. But when, especially when the motor maids, and I mean that with all due respect, um, when they start going professional in the 60s, that's really, you know, are there opportunities for other women, you know, uh, that are kind of being brought up but it seems to be that that is kind of like the minor leagues is the amateur racing. So. Thank you. I'm <coughs> She's doing that now, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think so too. I, and I think it's the competitive spirit. I think that, you know, that one thing about, you know, women in racing, I think is that they, it's, it's more of a human activity that it's not men or women. It's just that you get competitive, you want to compete. And so that doesn't mean you have to be friends with all the women. If you're a woman, you just, you want to compete just like men aren't friends with all the men. So. Yeah. <coughs> That's a good point. Because 